Bring it on. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, we're after uh, seven uh, seven thirty here. So, uh, what we're going to do is commence uh, the meeting, which is seven hundred and fifty. No, excuse me, the seven hundred and ninety fifth regular meeting of uh, the Civil War Roundtable in our second Zoom meeting. Uh, last month, it was 9-11, so we took a moment out uh, to uh, contemplate the events of 9-11-2001. Uh, this month, I would ask that we just take a few seconds to contemplate our very good friend who we lost in the interim, Ed Bars. Uh, I, most of us last saw him in uh, Virginia in, 2000, uh, in 2019. Some of us may have seen him after that. But if we could just take a few seconds to think about Ed and what he meant to us, if you please. Uh, certainly gone, but not forgotten. We thank Ed for everything he did for us and for so many millions of people. He's, he's beloved by everybody who knew him and by hundreds of thousands of people who didn't. Uh, Next uh, item on the agenda, we have an election. Uh, I find it a little weird that I'm running a, uh, my own election. Uh, of course, in the meantime, we're talking. I misplaced the, uh, the slate. Uh, but uh, we, because we were unable to do this last spring uh, in May and June, uh, we have fast forwarded it to now, October. And we are going to, uh, uh, I am instructed by uh, uh, those who have instructed me that we should announce the slate and then ask uh, for uh, a vote. The slate is for President Mark Matranga, first vice president John Sebastian, second vice president Kurt Carlson, treasurer Kurt Carlson, he, wore, he wears many hats, uh, Assistant Treasurer, uh, I'm sorry, Treasurer Kurt Carlson, Assistant Treasurer Karen, Karen Weber, uh, Secretary Dan Modes, and Assistant uh, Treasurer, uh, Assistant Secretary, excuse me, uh, Jim Aducci. Uh, I, uh, I suspect that if, if, if anyone would like to make any nomination from the floor, so to speak, uh, we are muted, but if you want to type in uh, a uh, Another nomination. You are, you are free to do so. I, uh, I, uh, and I will wait a few moments if anyone wants to do that. Otherwise, there being none, uh, I will. I, I suppose the only way I can do this uh, right now is just ask you all to. Uh, I, I, I don't know if I should presume a, a vote uh, of yes for the. <coughs> The slate. I would just. I, I would ask everyone who is a member. There may be some non-members here. Uh, I, we discourage anyone who's not a member, not vote. But you can type in in your chat uh, boxes uh, whether you approve of the slate or not, uh, yay or nay. Uh, if you would please, please do that so that we can complete this uh, part of the agenda and move on. Oh, excuse Show me. Show a thumbs up, Mark. Okay. Oh, and, and also, too, we have trustees. I, my, and I, I, I neglected to add the trustees whose uh, uh, terms will expire in 2021. I, I'm confused by, by this slate. Term, the, tr the trustees we're electing uh, whose terms will uh, expire in 2022 would be David Zucker, Dennis Doyle, Randy Doler, and Richard Fry. They are on uh, two. We have trustees' ex terms expiring in 2021, Tom Murray, Rick Branham, uh, Jenny Procunier, and Curtis Tomasco. I, I believe they are not up for election. Uh, Zucker, Doyle, Doler, and Fry are the trustees we are electing. So if you please, let's include them too. Uh, I haven't seen any sideways yet, uh, which would be all right with me, by the way. <laughs> Sometimes running these meetings is, I like to talk about the Civil War, but running meetings is not my fort. Uh, 
I move the slate be accepted by acclamation. Wherever that came from, that's good. Are there, is there a second? A second. There's a second. I see someone nodding. Bruce, thank you very much. Uh, in favor, uh, you can nod your heads too. That's a good. That's good by me. That's the equivalent of a, a voice vote. And I'm considering it, that all to be yeses. And uh, the slate is elected uh, a little bit late, but this is a, co uh, a COVID uh, uh, year. It's uh, like love in the time of cholera. So there we go. Uh, we'll be doing this again shortly next year, hopefully in person. Well, all right. On to the, uh, to the main event. We have Stuart Sanders uh, with us tonight. The subject being Perryville Under Fire, the aftermath of uh, Kentucky's largest civil war. Uh, there's no one better to talk on this subject as uh, Stuart was the uh, executive director of the Perryville Battlefield Preservation Association, I, I think for eight or nine years uh, at least. And so this expansion of the uh, Perryville Battlefield uh, took place in large part, while he was uh, uh, was the uh, executive director, obviously uh, there were many other uh, component parts to that. But uh, on his watch, this magnificent battlefield began uh, to be assembled. He was, deserves great credit for that. The last 15 years, he's been director of research and collections at the uh, Kentucky Historical Society. They have a great website. You should check it out. He's also author of uh, four, uh, four books, uh, including Perryville Under Fire, uh, The Battle of Mill Springs, uh, which is part of the Emergence Civil War series, uh, Maney's Brigade uh, at the Battle of Perryville, which is a more microcosm sort of uh, look at the battle, and his most recent, uh, which is Murder on the uh, Ohio Bell, which Stewart describes uh, as an examination of Southern honor, culture, interpersonal violence, uh, vigilante justice, and the Civil War through the lens of an 1856 murder on a steamboat. Sounds pretty interesting. Uh, he lives in Danville, Danville, Kentucky, as some of you have heard, and he's a, a gradu graduate of uh, Center College. Uh, other than him, there are many illustrious grads of, uh, of uh, Danville, uh, including John Breckenridge for our, our purposes. Uh, and uh, for those of us who are in the law field, uh, uh, several uh, noted uh, justices, including John Marshall Harlan, who wrote the famous defense in, uh, I, I'm sorry, famous dissent in uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, Chief Justice Vinson, who was Chief Justice just before uh, Earl Warren, uh, Vice President uh, Adlai Stevenson, who I think Adlai the third's grandfather, perhaps, but uh, the first Adlai Stevenson, and uh, John Stewart, who was Lincoln's law partner, uh, Center College, Danville, uh, Danville, Kentucky. So with that introduction, uh, I give you Stuart Sanders, Perryville thanks. under fire. Thanks, Mark. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks to Mark and uh, and Brian and also uh, Bruce for facilitating this. It's good to see Bruce again too. Um, I've, I think I've told him this once before. I met, gosh, I started emailing with Bruce back when he was working on the um, Colonels and Gray book, I think it was, right? And uh, gave him some info on Center College. And then he was kind enough to have me at the uh, Lincoln Davis of War Roundtable where I had one of the best meals I've ever had. It was uh, sausage and peppers and I ate quite a bit. It was good and a lot of fun, but uh, I have a have an affinity for Chicago. My my grandfather was a uh, a jazz musician in the 1930s. He played uh, saxophone for a band called Clyde McCoy, and you might be familiar with their song Sugar Blues, but they were actually the house band at the Drake Hotel in the 1930s. So he lived in Chicago for a long time. So uh, I have an affinity for the place. And I, I probably met some of you before when you toured the Perryville Battlefield um, with Ed and with others. And so uh, I really appreciate you guys having me here uh, tonight. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So if you hold on for just one second and uh, throw up a few things. Okay, everybody see that? Great. Well, uh, again, I, 
I'm very appreciative you all had me here. And, you know, several years after Kentucky's largest battle had raged outside of Perryville, um, there was a family that lived just north of the battlefield, and they were having a quiet afternoon. It was probably a, a Sunday afternoon dinner. And as they were eating, they heard a, a loud knock on their on their door. Well, when they answered the door, they found a one-armed man standing there. And um, they asked, said, may we help you? And he said, yes. You know, many years ago, I was a participant in the Battle of Perryville. Um, I was shot. I had my arm amputated. And I recovered in this house. May I go up to the room where I recovered? And so the family said, sure, come on in. They invited him upstairs. And he walked into the room and he looked around. And then he immediately went over to the window and he opened it. And he reached inside of a small crack in the window and he pulled out a small piece of paper and unrolled it. And he looked at it and then he turned to the family and he said, may I dig up my arm? Now, evidently, this man had actually drawn a map to show which corner of the house where his severed arm had been buried. Um, and after his arm was amputated, he managed to survive in what was undoubtedly a, a squalid field hospital setting. Um, so he survived the amputation. He survived any illness or disease or infection he could have caught, um, and then managed to return years later to dig up this, you know, frankly, grisly souvenir from the Battle of Perryville that he had. Um, this, of course, was one of the lucky ones. Many more soldiers, um, you know, were not able to survive, you know, operations. They were unable to survive uh, the field hospitals at Perryville. Um, and Perryville and surrounding communities, even as far as New Albany, Indiana, about 85 miles away from the battlefield, contended with wounded patients for months as wounded and sick soldiers filled churches, they filled businesses, they filled barns, they filled courthouses. Um, and, you know, these men confiscated livestock and really, you know, created uh, intense economic difficulty for many communities surrounding Perryville as a result of the aftermath of this battle. Now, as many of you know, um, in the summer of 1862, a uh, Confederate army commanded by General Braxton Bragg um, invaded Kentucky um, to divert uh, Union forces away from Chattanooga, which was a vital railroad junction. The Southern Army also hoped to recruit Kentuckians. They'd been told in you know, July 1862, um, when John Hunt Morgan raided the state, that if the Commonwealth were held for the Confederacy, that tens of thousands of Kentuckians would rally to the Southern banner. So they had this in mind when they entered Kentucky. So after stumbling around Kentucky for several weeks, um, the Union Army created a, a, a the Union Army got uh, literally thousands of reinforcements from across the Midwest and stormed down from Louisville to drive the, the Confederates out of Kentucky. Um, on October 8th, 1862, so you know, 158 days or 158 years ago this week, um, you had uh, um, roughly you know 40,000 Union and Confederate soldiers battled this north of Perryville, um, and they fought for nearly. Uh, five five hours, and um, essentially with nearly 1,600 casualties sustained for every hour of fighting, many of the veterans of Perryville, including Sam Watkins, you know, who fought in the 1st Tennessee Infantry Regiment, really remembered the fight as being one of the most intense battles that they ever experienced during the Civil War. So although the Confederate Army won a tactical victory at Perryville, meaning they shoved back both flanks of the Union Army and almost enveloped the Union I Corps and destroyed it, they instead encountered a strategic defeat because what they didn't realize is that sort of standing idly by as the battle raged were nearly 40,000 more Union soldiers who were ready to enter the fight, um, but um, did not. So when the Confederates realized that they were gonna be woefully outnumbered, they ended up leaving Perryville and ultimately left Kentucky. And they essentially left Kentucky in Union hands for the remainder of the war, which as we know, um, was incredibly uh, strategically important um, for the Union Army. Um, you know. They had hoped to get recruits. Um, only about 2,000 men ended up joining the Confederate ranks uh, during the 1862 campaign. So in a sense, uh, you know, th this invasion of Kentucky really had devolved into uh, just a major raid after uh, the Battle of Perryville. And uh, again, the, the battle kept uh, the state in Union hands for the remainder of the war, with the exception of some cavalry raids and a few smaller you know, uh, cavalry excursions into the state. Kentucky stayed in the Union uh, for the remainder of the war. So for the time engaged, though, casualties were severe. Again, I mentioned about 1,600 men were killed and wounded for every hour of fighting, but more than 7,500 men were killed and wounded in the five-hour fight. And so the Confederates, who were fighting with roughly 17,000 men, lost about 530 killed, 2,600 wounded, and about 250 missing. Of the nearly 18,000 Union troops who were actually engaged in the fight, 
they lost close to 900 men killed, 3,000 wounded, and almost 500 missing. So several regiments, um, including um, Confederates who fought on the, the northern end of the battlefield, suffered about 50% casualties. So, you know, it was, again, it was very rough on a number of brigades in both the, the Southern and, and Union Army. So, you know, again, it was sort of a turning point in the war. Um, if, if the Confederates, for example, had been able to uh, control Kentucky, they potentially could have moved into Indiana or Ohio. You know, if they, imagine if they had shelled Cincinnati, um, what could have happened? And they potentially could have uh, influenced Northern congressional elections that were held um, later on that year. So, you know, if, if, if the Confederates had won a more decisive victory during that campaign, you know, the Civil War history as we know it could have been quite different. But the Union Army um, or the Confederate Army left Perryville quickly and the Union Army sort of hung around town for a few days, sort of um, slowly beginning their pursuit of the rebel army. And um, when they did leave, essentially caring for the thousands of, of wounded soldiers and thousands of sick soldiers essentially fell upon Perryville's 300 inhabitants. So as you can imagine, um, having these thousands of sick and wounded men on this small community changed that community forever. Now, when night fell and the battle ended, an odd truce fell over the field as enemy troops used uh, torchlight to search for their wounded comrades. And there was a Union captain from Frankfort, Kentucky named Robert Taylor, who ended up helping remove the injured from the battlefield. And Taylor recalled shortly after the firing stopped that, quote, we started upon our mournful mission. There were already five or six parties of the character on the field, and every step we made toward the front, we met an ambulance returning slowly from the late scene of action with its groaning brethren. Now, Confederate Private Sam Watkins of the 1st Tennessee Infantry Regiment, who is, who's pictured here and, and talked about how intense the battle was, he also uh, removed the wounded from the field that night. And he later wrote in his fa famous memoir that he, quote, helped to bring off many a poor dying comrade. We helped bring off a man by the name of Hodge with his under jaw shot off and his tongue lolling out. We brought off Captain Lute B. Irvin. Lute was shot through the lungs and was vomiting blood all the while and begging us to lay him down and let him die. But Lute is living yet. Also Lieutenant Woldridge. He had both eyes shot out. I found him rambling in a briar patch. So again, pretty terrible scenes on the night of the battle as both Union and Confederate soldiers ended up scouring the field looking for their wounded comrades. And again, there was this um, odd truce that had fallen over the field as they were, um, both sides were searching um, for these wounded men. Another uh, uh, soldier from Indiana actually said that of all the horrible scenes that he'd ever seen, um, this was, of course, the worst thing that, that he had ever experienced. And, you know, he was particularly moved because many of the men from his regiment were actually buried in the cornfield in which they had fought. And this was a very uh, memorable scene for him as these men were um, rolled into the, their graves on the cornfield. So while most of the wounded were removed from the battlefield that night, some of the injured weren't taken off the field for as many as three, four, five, six days after the fight. And these forgotten troops had yet received any medical attention after Kentucky's largest battle. Now, by mid-October 1862, about uh, 10 battle, 26 Union Confederate hospital. That included 1,700 federal troops and about 900 Confederate soldiers. Um, most of the Confederates had actually been transported 10 miles away to Harrodsburg, Kentucky, um, after the battle during Bragg's retreat. And so about 1,700 men were left in that community um, and crammed the courthouse, churches, private homes, and other public buildings in that community. And I'm sharing this picture here. This is Christian Weinman, who's a soldier who's a member of the 21st Wisconsin Infantry Regiment. He was a young man, only about 18 years old. And he was actually shot in the side at the Battle of Perryville. And he was taken away about 16 miles west of Perryville to Springfield, Kentucky, um, where uh, a friend of his wrote his sweetheart and said that they thought that Christian was recovering but he was soon, quote, out of his mind, and he ended up dying from his wounds on uh, November 9th, 1862, about a month after the battle. And again, he was 18 years old, and he was simply buried in a churchyard uh, in Springfield. Now, surgical operations began on the field while the fighting was, was raging. There were makeshift field hospitals that were um, uh, put on the battlefield as soon as the firing started, essentially. Now, there was a man named E.L. Davison from Springfield, Kentucky, again, about 16 miles from the battleground. And he ended up following the Union Army to Perryville. He was a, a, a businessman, he owned a whiskey warehouse. And during the campaign, as Union troops um, mobilized and, and marched through Springfield, they actually uh, broke open his whiskey warehouse and uh, stole a lot of his bourbon. So E.L. Davison ended up 
um, essentially chasing the Union Army, sort of nipping at the heels of Union officers, demanding that he receive reparations for his stolen uh, whiskey. Um, and he ended up, when the fighting started, sort of um, sort of wandered toward the sound of the guns, curious as to what was happening, and stumbled upon a makeshift field hospital where doctors were prepping the wounded and they were furiously amputating limbs. And even though he was a businessman, even though he had no experience um, dealing with medical issues, um, he ended up volunteering as a surgical assistant. He would hold down men as their limbs were being amputated. And as he was holding, or as he was prepping one soldier who'd had a knee wound, um, his minister, the Reverend Miles Saunders, ended up wandering up and offered to help. Now, Davison later wrote that as the amputation started, quote, the bone was sawed off and naturally flew up, it not being held tight enough, spinning the blood over everything. Reverend Sanders fell over in a faint. So again, the aftermath of battle and for civilians who had to see sort of the uh, results of combat firsthand, this was truly a, uh, a stark and desperate situation for these civilians, um, just as equally as it was for the soldiers. Now, as you can imagine, uh, the battleground after Perryville, when you have roughly you know, 40,000 men battling one another for uh, uh, over four hours. Um, the battleground presented terrible scenes to those who experienced it. And curiosity really drove soldiers and civilians to the field to see what it looked like after the fight. Um, one member of the 36th Illinois Infantry Regiment actually wrote, quote, the road for miles was strewn with clothing, muskets, and military trappings of every description. Every farmhouse and barn along the route was tenanted with wounded rebels some of them with hardly life enough remaining to realize the horrors of their situation. Others mangled and bleeding presented sad sights and sounds never to be forgotten. And soldiers really concurred on this. When you read the letters and diaries from the men who were present at Perryville and were present on the field after the fight, they really you know, um, remark upon the chaos and the trash that was left behind and the muskets and the dead horses and really all that debris um, that one would imagine after a large battle. Um, however, this is pretty grisly, and I apologize for this, but the survivors were most shocked by the free-ranging hogs that were wandering around the battlefield and rooting up shallow graves and uh, were actually consuming dead soldiers. And um, soldiers had actually piled up fence rails around the corpses to protect them from these animals, um, but essentially these crude barricades were ineffective. There was a soldier named Charles Francis who was with the 88th Illinois Infantry Regiment. And he was simply appalled when he saw um, dead Confederates surrounded by these rails. And he later wrote that this was done, quote, so as to protect the remains from being attacked by the swine that prowled in the woods. The disgusting sight of these animals feeding upon human gore was more than sufficient to give them immunity from sacrifice by the hungry of our army. No one could be found sufficiently hardy to talk of eating the, the flesh of hogs captured near the battlefield. Now, the same thing happened after the Battle of Richmond, Kentucky, which was fought in late August, 1862. And uh, the hog market, the, the, um, it actually bottomed out as a result of the aftermath of Richmond and the aftermath of Perryville, because no one would buy hogs in central Kentucky with the worry that they were eating dead soldiers on these two battlefields. So it's a strange economic consequence of this large battle. And again, uh, when you read the diaries and the letters, you see quite often that soldiers are remarking on these uh, uh, pens that surrounded these bodies. So after the Battle of Perryville, essentially every home, barn, shed, church, business, anything with a roof became a makeshift field hospital um, for the wounded and the sick soldiers. There was a, a doctor named A.N. Reed who was with the uh, um, uh, U.S. Sanitary Commission, which is sort of like the American Red Cross today, and he remarked that as he traveled 10 miles from Maxville, Kentucky to the Perryville battlefield, he said that every house was a hospital. And when he reached Maxville, he said that in one 16 room tavern, there were 150 wounded and 36 soldiers who were just crammed in all of these rooms. Only 25 of the men were on beds. The remainder were essentially lying on straw on the floor. So again, pretty Spartan conditions. And uh, the situation was similar in Perryville. And this is an early image of of Main Street Perryville. It's called uh, Merchant's Row, which is the town's 1840s commercial district. So again, after the battle, you know, these streets, um, these overhangs in front of the buildings, these porches, um, they all would have been full of, of wounded and sick men after that, that fight. When federal surgeon remarked, quote, all the buildings suitable for the purpose that could be obtained in the district were immediately taken for hospitals. He added that those wounded belonging to the rebels were found scattered throughout the neighboring woods, and in such houses, barns, and stables as could be obtained during the hasty retreat of their army. 
And another doctor simply remarked that in Perryville, quote, every house was a hospital, all crowded with very little to eat. So that becomes a very common theme when you're looking at um, the primary sources related to the battle. You know, all these buildings were crammed with with soldiers of both armies. Every house was a hospital. Also, civilians sort of fled the scene and were starting to trickle back in to their community after the battle once the firing had stopped. Um, one soldier said, you know, every house in barn was filmed with the maimed, the dying, and the dead. They also said that because some fighting had occurred near the town of Perryville, a number of the homes were actually riddled with shell uh, fragments and cannonballs. So, you know, fairly stark uh, situation in Perryville after the battle. Well, at these hospitals, if you can imagine, there were few surgeons and very little medical attention. There was a private named Adam Johnson who served in the 79th Pennsylvania Infantry Regiment, and he was wounded below the knee, and he remained on the battlefield all night. And finally, the next day, he was hauled to Antioch Church, which is pictured here, which is located in Mercer County, Kentucky, um, basically close to the battlefield, just across the county line from the Perryville Battlefield. Now, when he was taken to Antioch Church, he wrote, that he and other wounded were, quote, thrown out in a pile like wood, for they'd been removing wounded off the battleground all night until the church was perfectly filled, and under every shade tree nigh at hand. I lay for six days out under a white oak tree with my wound dressed once. So again, a lack of, there was a lack of medical attention, and there's also a, uh, a, a critical lack of supplies at Perryville after the battle. The reason being that when the Union Army stormed down from Louisville in order to shove the Confederates out of the state, the Union commander, Major General Don Carlos Buell, ordered that only one um, ambulance should accompany every brigade. So essentially that meant that only one small wagon of, of medical supplies um, would be enough men for basically a 2,600 or be enough supplies for a 2,600 man brigade. And um, or 2,100. The average brigade at Perryville was about 2,100 men. So imagine one small wagon of supplies for 2,100 soldiers. It was certainly not enough, and many uh, soldiers suffered after the battle as a result of, of this order. And federal soldiers, federal surgeons were actually woefully unprepared as a result of this. Um, in fact, a lot of soldiers said that this order caused a lot of unnecessary suffering and even a loss of life. Now, there was hardly any opium or chloroform to dull the pain of the wounded. And uh, this is the home of uh, John C. Russell, who's a local farmer who lived um, near the Dixville Crossroads, which is an important battlefield landmark. And essentially, um, as the battle had raged for about four or five hours, both flanks of the Union Army were shoved back to that crossroads, and fighting became very severe around uh, the Russell House, which is, which is pictured here. And again, there was hardly any uh, um, anesthesia for the soldiers. And when Union surgeon J.G. Hatchett reached the home of John C. Russell, he said he, quote, found about 150 wounded, most of them lying on the ground in the yard. No supplies having reached this hospital, the surgeons were compelled to amputate without chloroform. So again, in this yard, this picture here, there were hundreds upon hundreds of amputations that went on without any sort of anesthesia whatsoever. So you have a lack of supplies which caused problems. But secondly, there'd been a, a terrible drought in Kentucky um, as a result of, um, it hadn't rained for weeks after the battle. And that's always a good reminder to take a quick, quick drink, but it hadn't rained for weeks and weeks. And soldiers were forced to drink out of stagnant pools of water. And there's one account of a soldier who was marching with the Union Army from Springfield, Kentucky to the Perryville battlefield. And his canteen had run dry. And he stopped at this algae covered pond and he brushed the algae away and he started filling up his, his canteen. And he looked down at one end of the water and his comrades were washing their, their feet and socks in this water. And then he looked down to the other end of the pond and there was a dead mule floating in the water. So again, soldiers were forced to drink out of a terribly polluted water, which is, as you can imagine, led to literally thousands of cases of dysentery and other illnesses as soldiers were affected by these waterborne illnesses. Furthermore, this lack of water um, um, led to the, uh, the spread of disease too. There was uh, one surgeon who remarked, the surgeons couldn't find enough water to wash the dried blood from their hands for two days. So you can imagine as these uh, surgeons are going from patient to patient without having the ability to uh, scrub their hands clean, they didn't understand germ theory at the time, you know, they spread illnesses from soldier or spread disease and infection from soldier to soldier. And so it was certain that these unsanitary conditions led to the deaths of, of scores of men as a result of uh, disease and then infections as well. So. The drought lasted actually fairly well past the battle and water had to be hauled into uh, Perryville field hospitals from miles away. So 
you know, that compounded the suffering of soldiers who were there. So as you can imagine, with all these soldiers, with all these wounded and sick men, economic, uh, an econo a stark economic impact on local civilians is not surprising at all. And um, again, with 80,000 troops in the area, the civilian population really suffered as a result of, of this campaign. There's a woman named Harriet Carrick who lived in downtown Perryville in a stately brick home. And uh, she lived there with her, her uh, eight children and 15 slaves. And she actually left, um, left her house when she heard that a battle was going to take place. When she returned, the home was in total disarray. Um, they, the, um, everything had been uh, knocked over. She thought that the soldiers were looking for things like sugar, um, coffee, family silver, maybe other valuables. But she also found that um, every piece of clothing that they left behind had been shredded to be used as bandages. So that gives you an idea of, of, of uh, how difficult this was and how the lack of supplies really affected the aftermath of the fight. Because again, surgeons were going around from house to house detailing men to rip up clothing so they'd have enough bandages to mend the wounds of these soldiers. So it just gives you an idea of what the aftermath was like during that time. And in her home, um, she was actually one of the lucky ones in a sense because her house was very stately. It was located at a central location. So instead of it being converted into a field hospital crammed with sick and wounded men, um, um, it actually became a headquarters for doctors in the area. So she was sort of lucky in, in that right. But the remnants of these field hospitals, is, they still remain at Perryville. There's still a number of buildings that that have blood stains on the floors to this day, you can still see. Um, there are a number of houses in town as well where um, soldiers rode on the walls or drew farm scenes. Um, there was a Missouri soldier who was recovering in one house um, on the east side of Perryville. And his name was Werner, uh, Werner Boll, and he wrote his name in large letters on the wall. So sort of the memory of these soldiers still exists in vandalism and then sadly in blood stains on the, the floor as well. Well, um, you know, these economic uh, consequences continued. John C. Russell, um, whose home during the battle, the one pictured here, it was uh, Alexander, General Alexander McCook's headquarters at the time of the battle. And after the fight, it served as a uh, field hospital for 17 days. And again, as you can imagine, his, his, his farm was completely ravaged by all these troops. So he lost 30 cords of wood, 40 barrels of corn, 2,000 bundles of wheat, 1,000 pounds of hay, and four horses. And one witness noted, uh, quote, the house was used as a hospital and everything about it was used or destroyed. And so it's a good sort of concise way to describe what all of these uh, local farmers experienced as a result of Kentucky's largest battle. Uh, Charles King Kirkland, who lived near the, uh, what is now the entrance to the Perryville Battlefield State site, um, his family also suffered. And his house was actually located near some of the heaviest fighting. And when the battle started, uh, just like Harriet Carrick in downtown Perryville, the Kirkland family actually packed up belongings and they went uh, to a county south of Perryville where they camped for several days on some family property. And when they returned, as you can imagine, they found their farm in total disarray. Their house had been occupied as a field hospital. All of their furniture had been smashed and burned for firewood with the exception of a cherry dining room table. It was dragged out into the yard. It was used as an operating table. So it was terribly bloodstained. All the cows, all the chickens were had been consumed. And actually, the outbuildings of the house had been dismantled and burned as firewood. That's how, you know, how desperate these soldiers were for warmth after the Battle of Perryville. Um, again, sadly, uh, family history, um, you know, amputated limbs were buried all over the yard. And they were buried in very shallow, uh, uh, you know, pits because of this drought. And so when it rained, uh, the severed arms and legs ended up sticking up through the dirt. You know, a very um, awful scene, as you can imagine. And Mrs. Kirkland swore that she would never live here. She took the family back south of Perryville to this adjacent county, um, and they never returned to their home. Um, so again, the um, Kirkland descendants still actually live in that county to this day. So essentially, the Battle of Perryville permanently displaced at least one family um, because of the aftermath and because of the hor horrific scenes that were, were uh, on that property at the time. Now, while hundreds and hundreds of civilians suffered from the battle, um, perhaps none lost more than Henry P. Bottom, who's a 47-year-old um, local cabinet maker in Justice of the Peace. And this is a picture of him. It was taken uh, when he was about 90 years old. So he lived for a long time after the battle, um, lived until about 1901, 1902 or so. And what I outlined here, he's a local cabinet maker and um, his house was literally caught in the crossfire as a result of the fight. It was located on uh, um, basically the Confederate left flank, Confederate soldiers commanded by Bushrod Johnson, Daniel W. Adams, Patrick Claiborne, and others actually stormed through his front yard to attack a, uh, a 
a, a Union uh, Infantry Regiment or a uh, Ohio Infantry Regiment and a Kentucky Union Infantry Regiment that were posted on a hill above the house. Um, so the house um, still has bullet holes through the walls to this day. It's privately owned. It's an incredible battlefield landmark. But as you can imagine, since his home was literally in the crossfire, he owned most of the land upon which the battle was fought. Henry P. Bottom suffered more and lost more than perhaps any other civilian. And I, I list these things here of what he lost. So again, you know, because these soldiers swept his property clean, he lost two horses, nine cows, 30 sheep, all this bacon and pork, corn, 50 bushels of oat, and 22 tons of hay. And it was said that for the first time ever, the Bottom family had to buy food to eat after the battle. That's how sort of self-sustaining they'd been. So what Bottom's family endured was well described by um, um, Springfield resident William McCord, who actually toured the battlefield um, the day after the fight is a rambunctious 12-year-old. And that morning, when he heard that a battle was taking place at Perryville, he ended up uh, strapping a Colt revolver um, under his coat, and he mounted his trusty horse, who was named Flash, um, and then rode the 15 miles or so to the Perryville battlefield. So imagine, you know, this 12-year-old kid uh, basically going off by himself, armed with a pistol, to tour uh, the site of a, a, a major battle. You know, um, sort of to my mind today is insane, but William McCord did that. And and what he saw, you know, essentially gave him nightmares for weeks. And upon reaching the battleground, one of the first places he passed was the Henry P. Bottom House, which is here. And I mentioned, you know, Confederate soldiers um, uh, crossed between the front and backyard of this house to attack. It was a major field hospital after the battle. And what McCord wrote, um, again, uh, well describes what happened on this property. And uh, as you look at this picture, you can sort of imagine this 12-year-old boy on his horse witnessing the scene. He said, the building was an old frame house with a long porch, the full length of the building. A large hospital tent was erected in the yard with ordinary tents at different places. Here we saw the evidence of real war. The house, tents, and yard were full of wounded Federal and Confederate soldiers. I can never forget the groans, wails, and moans of these hundreds of men as they lay side by side, some in the agony of death, some undergoing operations on the surgeon's table in one corner of the yard. Near a table was a pile of legs and arms, some with shoes on, others with socks, that stood some four or five feet high. So again, this young 12-year-old boy comes to the Perryville battlefield and sees a pile of severed arms and legs that stood four or five feet high, and what he saw gave him nightmares for weeks. He also remarked that behind the house, which you can sort of see on either side of the picture, there were about 300 men with coffee sacks over their faces, dead soldiers who were awaiting burial. So initially, there were probably men buried on this property as well. And uh, McCord said he soon sickened of this, of this site, this horrible site, and ended up riding off to a different part of the battlefield, um, which he also ended up exploring. So just as homes and farms were commandeered as hospitals, so too were local uh, Perryville institutions. So schools, businesses, and churches were hastily converted into crammed, poorly ventilated hospitals with little medical supplies or attention. Now, the Ewing Institute, which was an all-girls school pictured here that had been in operation since the 1840s, was among the many buildings that became crowded with the wounded after the battle. As you can imagine, the school's fencing was destroyed. It was burned for firewood. Interior plaster was ruined. Windows were smashed. Shutters destroyed. Desks dismantled. You know, stoves ruined. And the list of uh, uh, problems that went on at the school just goes on and on. Um, enrollment eventually declined in the years after the Civil War. Uh, the school went out of business. Uh, today, it remains preserved. It's a private residence. Um, but this, this house here was actually a field hospital until late March 1863. So for nearly five months, um, wounded and sick soldiers were crammed in this building, um, some recovering, some dying on the grounds of this, of this school. So, you know, again, uh, uh, rough on Perryville institutions. Churches also met with equal hardship. Um, in all Perryville churches, which were converted into hospitals, there were, you know, ruined fences, ruined carpets, ruined chandeliers. Um, burned pews. In some instances, pews were actually dismantled and were used to manuf uh, to build coffins to ship uh, some bodies back home. And so the list of, uh, of damaged churches, it's literally any community within 40 miles of the Perryville battlefield that had a standing church. That church essentially became a field hospital for wounded troops. They would break the windows to have better ventilation. And again, they would damage the floors and the pews. And the list of damages just goes on and on. One of the few churches that was not damaged as a result of the aftermath of the Battle of Perryville was an Episcopal church in Harrodsburg, Kentucky. And as I mentioned, Harrodsburg is 10 miles from the Perryville battlefield. 
the Confederate Army on their retreat away from the scene of the fighting, you know, snaked on this windy road about 10 miles to Harrodsburg. And there they filled the courthouse and churches, except for uh, the Episcopal Church that still stands in downtown Harrodsburg. And that's because uh, Confederate General Leonidas Polk, who was second in command at uh, the Battle of Perryville, was also an Episcopal bishop. And uh, Polk actually put a guard outside of the um, Episcopal Church in Harrodsburg and said that he didn't want anyone going in that building because uh, the men needed a place to pray. And so, you know, it's sort of an interesting vignette from the battle that despite all this carnage, despite the need, you know, this Episcopal bishop is also thinking about the spiritual needs of of uh, the wounded soldiers, but also for the civilians in Harrisburg, 1,700 civilians who had to care for roughly 1,700 men. So the number of wounded doubled the population of Harrisburg, Kentucky, which happened uh, um, at communities um, across the region. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few few minutes. Well, in um, while Perryville suffered, while Harrisburg suffered, um, Danville, Kentucky, which is located 10 miles east of uh, the Perryville battlefield. Um, Danville also contended with uh, literally thousands of ill and wounded troops. Now, there had been a chaos that descended upon Danville during the autumn campaign. As early as September 27th, you know, uh, um, about 10 days before the Battle of Perryville, several buildings on the Center College campus, which Mark had mentioned Center before, um, those buildings were commandeered by Confederate troops and were converted into field hospitals for the sick men who could no longer uh, march. When you look at this picture. Um, you can't see uh, Center College in this one, but um, on the left is a church. On the far right, you can sort of see the steeple in the distance. Um, all these buildings here were field hospitals after the battle, uh, crammed with, with sick men. Now, at it, uh, Center College, um, which is pictured here, uh, this building was built uh, in about 1819 or so. Uh, it's, today, it's called Old Center. It's sort of a focus of the campus. Um, in addition to, as, as Mark mentioned, John C. Breckenridge attended the school, John Marshall Harlan, um, um, John Todd Stewart, Lincoln's law partner, uh, went to center, but um, Brigadier General James S. Jackson, who's a Union general, was actually killed at Perryville um, on the northern end of the battlefield. Um, he was a center uh, graduate, and some of the Confederate troops who were fighting him and attacking his position were also center grads. Um, Joseph Horace Lewis, who commanded the famed Orphan Brigade for a time, um, also attended this college. But um, in late September, as Confederate soldiers took over this building, it became one of their main hospitals for uh, soldiers who became sick during the 1862 campaign. Elizabeth Patterson, who was a staunch Unionist in town, she was the wife of the Center of Mathematics professor, she remembered the uh, Confederate presence in her diary. And she wrote, at night, the college campus would be lighted up by cheerful campfires around which the soldiers at the hospital would gather, sitting upon logs of firewood and singing rebellious songs like Dixie. So again, you can imagine the scene, you know, logs filling this lawn in front of the building, tents were set up across the building and uh, Confederate soldiers sort of camped in and around this, um, not realizing that within a few days they would become embroiled in Kentucky's largest battle. So on October uh, 13th, five days after the battle, um, the Federal Army finally marched into town. So again, it had been five days after the Battle of Perryville, and uh, they finally reached Danville, just 10 miles away. And, and there's a great um, um, Harper's Weekly uh, engraving that shows essentially this scene here, but it has uh, it shows a regiment of Union troops coming in. It's throngs and throngs of, of Danville's Unionist citizens uh, were here to uh, were there to greet them. Um, Danville is a very staunchly Unionist community. There was a, a, a strong anti-slavery strain that ran through the professors of Center College, local ministers. There's also a large population of free blacks, so I think contributed to that too. So um, in the midst of this, you go from a Confederate occupation to a very, very joyful federal occupation or a federal presence. Um, but that you know, sort of joy that the, the uh, citizens here had was immediately dimmed when um, they brought thousands upon thousands of sick Union soldiers and dropped them in, in essentially homes, churches, buildings, and other uh, um, um, churches and any building they could. So again, the town became full of patients, but this time Union soldiers. So when the college was occupied uh, by the Union Army, the only room in this building, Old Center, that was not occupied um, was uh, Dr. Orman Beatty's uh, chemistry lab. And unfortunately, I forgot about the little window where you can see me, but um, trust me that Orman Beatty, probably hidden behind uh, my picture here, was a very handsome man, and he's, he's pictured right here, but uh, sorry you can't see him, but his chemistry lab was the only building or the only room in this structure. It was on the left-hand side of, of the first floor. It was uh, the only uh, room that was not occupied. It was a chem lab, and 
Um, some, some students had classes in that building. And one student, you know, probably 15, 16 years old at the time, remarked that the only room, quote, we had to pass through a room uh, to get to their classes. We had to pass through a room occupied by one of the federal surgeons or several of them as a dead house or postmortem room. I might state here that I've seen more than one postmortem examination held in this room while I was passing through. Um, it probably weren't postmortem exams. It was probably an embalming room, actually. Because in Danville, even though a lot of men were buried in the local cemetery, um, there were dozens upon dozens of men who were embalmed and then were sent home uh, to be buried in communities across the Midwest. So as you can imagine, damage to this college building was also severe. All the stucco was broken off the columns, soldiers destroyed desks, benches, um, walls, windows, chemistry equipment, and more. The list of damages just goes on and on and on. There were two literary societies in the uh, second floor and uh, you know, their bookcases were completely torn apart. Many of the books were, were destroyed. So at the end of October, 1862, about three weeks after the battle, there was a local resident named Fanny Bell who wrote a letter to her aunt. And she said, we have 3,500 federal soldiers and something over a hundred Confederates in town. You can imagine what Danville is like with that much sickness. The courthouse, seminary buildings, every church and unoccupied house, private dwellings and all, are full to overflowing. So as Danville had approximately 4,500 residents in 1862, having 3,500 sick soldiers, you know, it didn't double the population of the town, but it came awfully close. And this would be the equivalent, there are about 15,000 people who live in Danville now with having, you know, 11, 12,000 sick people dropped in the community. And, uh, you know, we couldn't handle it in 2020, having those sorts of casualties left here. And uh, they certainly couldn't handle it in 1862 either. So area churches were turned over. And um, as one, one doctor mentioned, he said, there were a lot of, of men who were suffering from typhoid fever, diarrhea, and pneumonia. Many of the men had no clothing except for what was on their backs. Um, and in one church, only three small kettles were used to cook for about 78 patients. So again, as these churches were filled, um, like the two that are pictured here in this picture became pretty, uh, pretty rough. Um, this picture is Trinity Episcopal Church located on Main Street. It's actually the, uh, the one on the left here. That's this building right here. And when members of the U.S. Sanitary Commission, again, a group like the Red Cross, visited this church, you know, they found conditions here to be, um, you know, unsurprisingly inact inadequate as they were um, across central Kentucky as a result of, of the Perryville battlefield. So you had 161 patients crammed into this church, all on the first floor, and there were only three small kettles and three frying pans that were available to cook for all of those men. So, you know, just having to cook for 161 patients when there was such a terrible scarcity of water, um, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine today, but there were actually both Union and Confederate soldiers in this building. Um, typically, they were segregated by what side they, they fought for. Um, but again, as you can imagine, um, any fencing would have been destroyed. The windows were broken. Pews were destroyed. Um, all these churches suffered very similar, similar damages. Um, one, one witness wrote that the walls were, were blackened over and had been written over uh, considerably. Now, members of this church were uh, very sad because there had been a terrible fire that had swept through Danville in February 1860. It actually took place on George Washington's birthday. Um, and when it burned, it actually only left the brick walls of this church standing. It took them about two years to repair it. The church had, op uh, the church had reopened its door um, in about August 1862, so just a few months before the Battle of Perryville reopens. Then it's overturned again as a result of the aftermath of the fight. And one resident um, named Mrs. H.L. Newland said, I know some of the members were dreadfully distressed to think their church was being used for a hospital when they had just gotten it fixed up. So again, you know, this was a, a, a shock to the sensibility of of residents in 1862 as all these buildings were, were taken over. Mortality rates were also very severe in these inadequately staffed and supplied hospitals. Um, a doctor from the Sanitary Commission remarked that he toured one church uh, that had 128 patients in Danville. When he returned the next morning, there were only 65 men still alive. So, you know, almost half of those men died uh, the, the night, um, in the night. So, I mean, terrible casualty statistics there. And uh, again, many men were buried in the uh, local cemetery. Um, Elizabeth Patterson, the wife of that mathematics professor that I mentioned earlier, she actually said the long rows of soldiers' graves in the beautiful cemetery of town attests to the mortality at that time of suffering. So it gives you an idea of how many men were lost. So while a variety of diseases plagued the soldiers, again, I mentioned typhoid, uh, dysentery, 
There were some measles outbreaks too. Um, many of the men in Danville were actually ill from typhoid fever. That seemed to be sort of the prevalent disease. Um, soldiers also suffered from typhoid pneumonia, as they called it. And, you know, as we know, during the Civil War, it was mainly illnesses and disease that, that killed most soldiers. And, you know, Colonel Kern Pope, who's pictured here, he fought for the 15th Kentucky Union Infantry Regiment. Um, that was the regiment that uh, was posted on the hill above the Henry P. Bottom House and endured uh, terrific fighting on the, the Union right flank as the Confederate soldiers swept past Bottom's house to attack his position. And during the battle, um, Kern Pope was actually wounded in the arm. He called it the fleshy part of my arm. <clears throat> and even though he appeared to be recovering, he actually uh, died in November 1862 um, from an illness. And it, it, was, it was considered at the time that it was typhoid pneumonia or typhoid fever. He had actually um, followed the Confederate army, even though he was wounded to Crab Orchard, Kentucky, about 30 miles away. But he became so sick that he ended up uh, returning to Danville, where he went to the home of a, a relative and ended up passing away. So um, it gives you an idea, even though these men survived um, you know, the ferocious fighting of this battle, um, in the end, for many of them, it was, it was drinking polluted water or some other illness or disease that ended up taking, taking their lives. Um, Fanny Bell, who I mentioned before, she said that the sickness is not only confined to the soldiers. Almost every family has some cases, not all dangerous, but all are complaining with the dreadful camp disease. And that would probably be uh, typhoid fever. And uh, she said, not a, not a day passed without one or more funerals. Several ladies of prominent families died from this fever. So as um, you know, illnesses just basically raged through the community after this battle. And you know, just as it was in Perryville, there was a severe lack of medical supplies. There was a lack of water. There was one doctor in, um, in Danville who paid $1 out of his own pocket for the only ounce of opium that was still available in town. Because when the Confederates moved through, they basically stripped the, the community clean. So nothing was left to care for all of these, these wounded. So many of the wounded soldiers were left in Perryville, Danville, Harrodsburg, Bardstown, 40 miles away where 2,000 sick and wounded Union troops were left. And you know, as I mentioned, many of these men like Kern Pope never made it home. Um, Dr. Jefferson J. Polk, who was a local doctor in Perryville, um, wrote in his diary that hundreds of the wounded died every week. So again, we know the mortality rates were, were fairly high at Perryville. Um, a, another doctor just simply said that the mortality has been large. Because of disease and complications, as we know, many died from October 9th, 1862, the day after the battle, until December 24th, there were post-battle deaths every day. We know that much. Um, we can't find a record of anyone dying on Christmas Eve um, but however, Christmas Day, the death started again. We know that at least one person died between, from their wounds from October 9th, 1862 until um, um, June 30th, 1863, more than eight months after the fight. And there are bound to have been deaths after that. But we know during this period of eight months after the battle that um, the number of deaths was fairly staggering. A lot, of, um, a lot of people died as a result of the battle for months after the fight. Um, the Perryville Hospitals closed and March of 1863, about five months after the battle, but they remained open in Danville for much, much longer after. So with all these men dying, where were they actually buried? So again, the Union Army held the field after the Battle of Perryville, and the Confederates left most of their dead on the battlefield unburied. And the Union Army, who were angered over stories that um, Confederates had rifled through the pockets of dead soldiers, that they'd stole Union's shoes, for example, um, the Union Army refused to bury the Confederate dead, and eventually um, um, the local sanitary commission put pressure on the Union Army as local hogs were digging up bodies, and, you know, the sanitary commit, um, uh, circumstances of Perryville became horrific. Finally, um, um, the Union Army impressed slaves, they impressed Southern civilians, and buried most of the Confederates in two large pits um, on the Perryville battlefield. And that, that cemetery still exists today, and there's this monument over over it now, and preservation efforts at the battlefield started around the cemetery. Um, Henry P. Bottom, who I pictured earlier, you know, who owned uh, um, most of the, the battlefield, um, he uh, uh, also buried a number of Confederate soldiers as well. So he was sort of uh, instrumental in, in burying a lot of the, the dead Confederates. Um, local stories still abound. Students from the Kentucky School for the Deaf in Danville traveled 10 miles with one of their teachers and actually helped bury the dead. There are also um, local stories that have been passed down in families of, of young men who were paid a dollar to move bodies, and they did so by heating up bayonets that they found on the battlefield, bending them into hooks and dragging the bodies to a central location. So 
you know, very grim, uh, grim experiences for the young people of Perryville as a result of this battle. So um, that's what happened to the Confederates and the Union Army um, actually buried their own uh, first where they had fallen. As I mentioned, you know, some um, um, Indiana soldiers were buried in a cornfield. The 105th Ohio was buried near the roadside near where they had fought. And um, um, these men were eventually moved to what was called the Perryville National Cemetery, um, which was established west of Perryville. However, the federal government could never get a good claim on the property at that time. So they ended up moving those dead to uh, uh, Camp Nelson in Jessamine County, which remains a national cemetery to this day. So as I've, as, I've, as I've told you about, it's been difficult to track casualties of these dead, but we do know that Perryville suffered, Danville suffered, you know, communities were completely overwhelmed by the number of wounded soldiers. And um, the official records aren't always accurate as to the casualty numbers, so we'll never really know the true accounting of the aftermath of the Battle of Perryville, but we do know that at least one-fourth of the men um, who were wounded probably died. I'll give you one final quick point. Henry P. Bottom, again, who, who buried a majority of the dead, actually applied to uh, get reimbursed for the losses, the economic losses he sustained as a result of the battle. And in that war claim testimony, when he was trying to get reparations for his lost items, um, his uh, local doctor was, was uh, actually interviewed. And the doctor was asked, did Henry P. Bottom ever recover from the Battle of Perryville? Now, the attorney who asked that question was, of course, looking for an economic answer. However, uh, Henry P. Bottom's physician put a psychological twist on it. He said, no, sir, um, he never uh, got over the battle. He was broken in spirit from that time on until he died. As I mentioned, Henry P. Bottom lived for another 45 years to the age of 90. And so again, suffering terrible post-traumatic stress. So not only were the men who fought the Battle of Perryville casualties, but also the civilians who endured the aftermath of Kentucky's largest battle are also forgotten casualties that we should remember today. So thank you very much for having me. Uh, I've really enjoyed this conversation and had a great time talking to you guys ahead of time. Um, I'm gonna quit sharing my screen now. Um, yeah, first thing, uh, real quick, if you want, want to learn more, uh, I've got the book Perryville Under Fire, and then this is my newest, which is uh, um, uh, Murder on the Ohio Bell. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Stuart. That, that's, a, that's a terrific uh, presentation. Uh, we study these battles, and then we moved on, we move on to the next one. You know, we, we, as uh, a lot of us, uh, we, f we follow the army to the next campaign and we leave, we, we, we leave the civilians behind. Uh, I, personally, I have become very interested in what happens after the battle or the war uh, moves on, uh, especially with World War II, my wife, both my wife and I, uh, who has DP, DP parents are, interested in that subject. But here I'm sure uh, I, I'm sure our uh, our group has questions of you and we can uh, we can we can handle those by uh, writing them in on our chat screens or what, whatever we call them. I'm very uh, unsavvy tech wise, but we I'm sure we have the facility to ask some uh, very good questions. Yeah, do, Mark, do you mind if I go ahead and answer one that I see on here? Yeah, there's Bruce. Yeah, um, Scott McElvain asked too. He said, "How do I find uh, how do I find out more about how current Pope died?" He's my great great grand uncle, so I'm, I'm glad I shared that image of him. And uh, um, Pope was actually buried. Um, so he went to the home of uh, um, there was a center college. There was an attorney in town, or no, a minister a minister and a or an attorney in town who's a trustee of Center College who lived in Danville. And uh, um, he went back from Crab Orchard, Kentucky to, uh, to that man's house where he ended up passing away. Um, Pope was, uh, the Popes were an extremely prominent family in Louisville. And so he's actually buried at Cave Hill Cemetery in Louisville, Kentucky. And to find out more, um, there's a great um, regimental history of the 15th Kentucky Infantry Regiment that goes into a lot of detail. Um, and of course, right now I'm drawing, you know, I'm on the spot, so I can't remember the name of the book or the author, which I used to be able to rattle off like crazy. Um, it's Kirk Jenkins wrote it, um, K-I-R-K Jenkins. I'd encourage you to read that to find out more about uh, current Pope. A really interesting story, and it's an incredible regiment too um, that fought throughout the war. Um, Bruce uh, mentioned Stuart from the uh, post-war claims for compensation. Uh, 
Do you have any idea of the money damages from the battle? I don't have a total on that. Um, the Ewing Institute, for example, um, asked for $1,000. Um, the Russell House, which I mentioned, you know, was caught in the crossfire. He asked for about $900. Um, so, you know, you can extrapolate it from there. Probably most institutions were looking for anywhere between $500 to 2,500. Now, um, Henry P. Bottom was looking for more than $8,500 in damages. Again, he owned most of the land um, upon which the battle had been fought. And, you know, if you put that into today's dollars, it's about $90,000, um, you know, in loss. So I don't have a total for you, Bruce, but, you know, you can imagine it's uh, tens and tens of thousands of dollars. And then you have all these surrounding communities that applied for war claims. You know, I think Center College asked for about $5,000, for example. So um, I haven't tallied all that up, but it would be uh, a princely sum um, indeed. But um, uh, Scott again asked, he said, how long was it before water was no longer a problem? Um, it actually sort of snowed after the battle, believe it or not. You know, there's always that story that sort of bad weather rolls in. Um, so the poor soldiers who, you know, were in these field hospitals, a number were lying outside, uh, then had to endure sort of a light snowfall for a while. It was actually several weeks until uh, um, water became, uh, um, you know, sort of more readily available for people. There was finally some rain that came in. Um, when I worked at Perryville, one year we had a sustained drought and it, it did not rain for a long time. And literally the creeks and streams were completely dry and it sort of gave us a real indication of what it would have been like in 1862. However, the springs that they talked about, like the Crawford Spring where Bragg had his headquarters, you know, they talked about one reason he was there is because there was still water. And, uh, you know, miraculously, uh, the Crawford Spring was still pumping out water that time too. So, you know, um, a lot of that, uh, um, you know, a lot of that handled. Um, so um, one question is, so were dead men included under the killed or wounded figures? The wounded men who died in the after action reports were included as wounded. Um, so, you know, on the... Um, Again, you know, the, the Confederates had, I think it was 535 killed, I think it was. Um, uh, the Union had 894 killed. So they were immediately killed in action. Then the wounded men who died, um, you know, um, uh, were treated as wounded in the official reports. But we do know as a total number of casualties, uh, that's probably about 7,800 men or so um, who were killed and wounded during the Battle of Perryville. That does not count the men who became sick. So that's a totally different number. Um, you know, we don't know how many died from illnesses, for example, um, at this point. But, you know, again, as that civilian noted, the uh, the tombstones in the local cemeteries around central Kentucky shows that in, in Lebanon, Kentucky, or Lebanon, if you're from Virginia originally, um, in Lebanon, um, there's a national cemetery down there that's full of Perryville casualties too, because there was a railway line that actually went up from, uh, from Lebanon toward Louisville. So you know, they would try to push wounded soldiers down there too. And, you know, the soldiers tried to get away as well. If, if you were lightly wounded, you would try your hardest to get away from the chaos of Perryville where illness was running rampant, where, you know, there was nowhere for shelter. But one thing I talk about in my book um, that might interest you guys is that the footprint of this battle was actually huge. This is one thing I examined because, you know, um, not only was the physical footprint huge, but um, civilians from the Midwest, from Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, Illinois, you know, all these states, when they learned that their, their husbands and their sons and their fathers had been wounded at Perryville or killed at Perryville, they would come down to the battlefield. Um, and so you had these incredible stories of sometimes, you know, it'd be, you know, a woman traveling, a young unmarried woman traveling by herself, you know, a big shock to Victorian sensibilities of, you know, a young woman traveling unescorted to a battlefield. But there was one woman from Michigan who ended up uh, coming down because her brother dead, but he's uh, him under the door, uh, sort of ended up, you know, finding him and sort of nursing him back to health and taking him home. Also, a number of uh, people would come down to find, um, um, to basically, uh, dig up their uh, children, which is really sad stories. And they would write letters home about where to find um, the bodies and, you know, how best to, you know, secure them. So it was um, a pretty sad, sad situation. I'm, I'm going to be kind of uh, grotesque here, but one problem with the battlefield was you had, say, your, your, your brother had been killed fighting for the 105th Ohio. Um, none of the graves were marked. So people would go down, they would go from grave to grave, um, digging up the body, looking to see if it was your relative and then dropping them back in the hole. And a lot of times they didn't rebury them properly. So you would have arms and legs and heads that were left sticking up out of the dirt. Um, and that just shocked people. And editorial writers were furious at this and really wanted the Union Army to ban civilians from coming down to the battlefield to dig up graves since it was hollowed ground. And so that was a, a big complaint 
Um, but again, just, you know, horrific circumstances. And I apologize to be, uh, you know, uh, pretty grotesque on that, but it's just true what happened. And it, you know, makes the aftermath of the fight so much more shocking. Any more questions from anybody? Be happy to answer. Uh, I, I, Oh, here we go. Scott, one from Scott. Yeah, Scott said, I was at Perryville about eight years ago. I was impressed with the topography. You could look across as though it was the same level and not realize. Yeah. And so it's interesting because the topography of Perryville is important because during the battle, the Union Army used the, su the successive hilltops in Perryville to establish defensive positions. So they'd be shoved back from one ridge. They would immediately form on another hill. And that's why um, participants of the fight remarked that it was such a, uh, a savage, intense battle. So Sam Watkins, who I'm sure you're all familiar with from the Ken Burns Civil War series, he noted the intensity of the fight because, again, he was going from one hill to another. You know, these hills were only a few hundred yards apart, so it seemed like the battle was never ending. There was no long open plain where soldiers could retreat for a long way to a wood or to another hill. They had to immediately stop and form another position. There are also some optical illusions at Perryville. There's um, one hill. It's a hill between two other ridges, and that middle hill is actually riddled with grape shot and canister shot from where uh, um, artillerymen got confused by an optical illusion, thought the Confederates were on one hill, and they poured artillery fire into that ridge, not realizing they were actually one hill over. Um, so, you know, things like that are pretty interesting. Yeah, there are also deep ravines um, in Perryville. There's uh, on the, the center of the Union line, there's a sinkhole, and it was said that um, his Confederates uh, under uh, um, General uh, John Brown descended from that ridge. The casualties were so severe as they tried to attack up the hill against two artillery batteries that the sinkhole literally ran red with blood. That's one story. And it was said that uh, um, a lot of dead, the Union Army sort of tossed dead Confederates into the sinkhole after the battle, too. So, you know, the topography, uh, it affected the battle, but it also affected the aftermath of the fight. That's a great question. I, I was just wondering. I think I'm unmuted, so I'll just ask, mm -hmm. uh, how long did it take the government to uh, dig up the, uh, these graves and uh, inter them into, uh, into the, the original cemetery? Yeah, so, uh, you know, again, the Confederates were sort of buried, buried once that we know of, um, but we do... You know, there are stories over the years of, of relic hunters using metal detectors who have found, you know, the buttons on a dead man's coat. They found skeletons or bones. Um, so we, we do know that um, those are actually from reliable sources. So we know, you know, when I was at Perryville, I sort of treated the preservation of that ground like we were preserving hollowed ground, not only for the fact from the fact that a battle had been fought there, but also because we were essentially trying to preserve one vast cemetery. Um, the Union Army was taken from um, their temporary graves. Um, it was a couple of years after the battle, and they were eventually moved a couple of years after that. So it probably took around four or five years until they were taken to Camp Nelson National Cemetery. Sadly, though, headstones were lost during that process. If you go to Camp Nelson today, um, most of the graves of the Perryville dead are simply marked unknown. So most of the Confederates who were buried are unknown, you know, dropped into several large pits. And these individual Union graves are also uh, unknown to this day, which is you know, a, sort of the deep tragedy of the battles. So they once knew who they were, but now they don't. Fortunately, Kurt Holman, who's the uh, Perryville Park Manager for years, he retired a couple of years ago. He started a Perryville Casualty Database recording every name that he could. And I think he has about, again, close to 7,800 uh, names in that database. So he's got a good idea of um, most of the men who were probably killed and wounded. And that was a, you know, that took him decades to pull together. But it's a valuable resource for, for researchers. It, it seems there's a real logistical, I mean, it's a huge logistical tax. I mean, obviously, as you described, many, many men died on the retreat. So that's, that's one thing. But among the people who died, it appears from what you said that perhaps most of the Confederates were at least buried in the mass grave. Right. Whereas the Union dead were scattered by and large across, I mean, we know how that battle was fought. So that is it possible then that as we march along this battlefield, let's say you're giving us a tour, there, there still may be buried soldiers. Oh, yeah, that I, that's definitely. I think, you know, again, they were buried in cornfields. They were buried on ridgetops. They were buried uh, by the side of a road. Um, they were buried by fences. I mean, you know, it's 
Well, I'll give you a good example. Um, after the battle, there was a, a Confederate who fought in the 1st Tennessee Infantry Regiment who buried something like 27 of his comrades in a ravine. Um, and I don't think that those men were ever moved from that ravine. And it's located between what we call Stark Weathers Hill and then another ridge on the Union left flank. Um, and there, you know, uh, those men were never moved. So when you're in that area, and there's been, you know, farmers who didn't realize this over the years, probably bulldozed the property to some extent. So we don't know how deep they would be, but, you know, we do know at least those, you know, 27 members of the, the um, first Tennessee are buried there. With the exception of one, uh, there was a young printer named Robert Hamilton who fought in the first Tennessee. Um, he lived in Nashville before the war, but he was a native of Lexington, Kentucky. And um, his body was actually moved by his sister-in-law and uh, was taken to the Lexington Cemetery about a week or two after the fight. Um, and he's actually buried next to his brother, who's a Union soldier. So, you know, sort of gives you an idea of the, you know, familial divisions of the Civil War in Kentucky by going and standing at that grave. But, um, but could the same be said for the Union side that we I think had? so. I, you know, I, I think when you're dealing with that many numbers, you know, there's a good chance that, you know, one regimental plot could have been forgotten about. Um, you know, we don't have, I've never seen a record. I'm sure it's in the National Archive somewhere, but I've never seen, you know, a map, for example, of where these regiments buried their dead. So I think that's, you know, there's a, a pretty good chance of that. And, you know, you also run into the, the situation, which is, you know, horribly sad to think about where a man could have been wounded or, a you know, a young man especially could have been wounded. And they could have crawled off to a corner of the battlefield and essentially had been forgotten and a local farmer just could have buried them. There's some accounts of that happening in town. There was limited skirmishing in town. And there was supposedly a toll gate keeper who had a dead Confederate soldier on his property for a long time. And, you know, finally, the army came along and buried him. And I, I would bet he was probably, that grave was never marked and he was probably never moved. So, you know, again, I think when people go there, they need to go there with the idea in mind that, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's still sort of a cemetery, but it's still, you know, yeah, it's still a, yeah. Birth. But, I, you I, know, I, again, I, like current Pope, there were wounded men who, uh, you know, were taken to Louisville. There were, you know, New Albany, Indiana hospitals across the Ohio River from Louisville. So there are men probably buried there. So, you know, casualties from Perryville, you know, you know, are, pro are just miles and miles away, not including the men who were eventually, you know, sent home to the Midwest too. So all over the place. I, I guess it's something I never thought about. I, I suspect any large Civil War battle, Gettysburg, Antietam, Shiloh, whatever, but places like Gettysburg, there was a sizable town thereby. And of course the Union Army stayed on the field. So one doesn't get the the impression that there were many uh, unidentified bodies right there. Whereas here, one gets a from your from your talk, I, I get a totally different impression. How does Perryville compare to other larger battles? Do you think, if if you can make an assessment? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the chaos of the aftermath, in a sense, was worse because. Um, the, most of the Union Army moved on. They just left a small contingency to oversee the hospitals there and sort of, you know, bury their dead. And so because of that, you know, with the town only having 300 inhabitants, it meant that there was a scattered footprint of the aftermath. The soldiers were sent to all these different towns. So it wasn't like, you know, Gettysburg, for example, or Sharpsburg, you know, um, I'm assuming from what I remember, that, you know, most of the wounded were much more concentra concentrated. But again, at, at, at Perryville, because of um, the lack of supplies, the lack of water, the lack of shelter, because the town was so small, you have wounded and sick men who were just scattered, you know, around probably a 40 or 50 mile radius, take, taken to, you know, Perry of 11 in Harrisburg, Springfield, Danville, uh, you know, Bardstown, the list just goes on and on and on. So, you know, because of that, you had walking wounded who were trying to get up to Louisville to, to find their way home, for example. And, you know, sad part is most of the Union Army were, were raw recruits. I mean, I showed the picture of Christian Weinman, you know, that poor young man who was buried 16 miles away from the battlefield of Springfield. He was about 18 years old. You know, that regiment, they'd been in the Army for less than a month. Many of the men had never before fired their rifles. That's how green they were. And yet they were sort of trapped between two ridges when Confederate Brigadier General George Romaney's brigade stormed down a hill and, 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 and you know, crushed them and caused probably 40 to 50 percent casualties from that regiment. So, you know, um, um, these new troops, once they were wounded or sick, you know, were sort of just trying to get back to Louisville and get home. Um, another question was, can you comment on why Buell's headquarters were the base between three large hills and not on one of them? As a result, he had an inability to hear the battle. That's one interesting thing at Perryville. There were three corps at Perryville, 
um, each roughly numbering about 20,000 men. And the bulk of the fighting took place uh, with Alexander McCook's uh, first corps. The second and third corps of the Union Army were south and west of town and were never really engaged in the battle. And one reason for that is there was a phenomena, phenomenon on the field called an acoustic shadow. And because of the wind direction and because of Perryville's rolling terrain, the sound of battle was supposedly, you know, you couldn't hear it west of town. So Buell sitting down in sort of a ravine and his, you know, 20,000 men about between a mile and two miles from the battlefield um, never heard any of the fighting taking place. He only heard a few scattered shots. And he said, tell those men to quit wasting that powder. And he didn't realize that, you know, his arm, his first corps was being sort of overrun by veteran Confederate soldiers. Um, he, had, he had been sort of bucked off his horse. Um, and I think, you know, he was sitting kind of in this ravine by a house uh, with his leg propped up. And I think that injury is probably why, you know, they were not expecting a fight either because the Confederates had withdrawn from Bardstown when they stormed down from Louisville, about 40 miles from Perryville. They withdrew from Springfield about um, 16 miles from Perryville. And then, you know, they expected them fully to withdraw again, but the Confederates um, were trying to stay between the Union Army and some supplies they'd established about 20 miles to the east. So they decided to make a stand and fight at Perryville. Um, also, Confederate General Braxton Bragg had been confused by a diversion that Buell had used. Buell had sent a division um, toward uh, Frankfort, Kentucky, where Bragg was at the time. And when uh, um, um, that division began shelling Frankfort, um, Bragg thought he was facing the, uh, uh, the majority of the Union command. Um, and he'd been fooled, did not realize they were facing a much larger force at Perryville. And that's one reason the battle was fought there. Um, another comment from Scott, I think current Pope could have been a great general had he lived. He was a West Point graduate. His loss to disease was a real tragedy. And I think, you know, if you read that regimental history by uh, um, Kirk Jenkins, I think you'll get a sense of that too. It was a really interesting regiment. I think the men had a lot of, uh, a lot of faith in him too. And so I think you're right on that one. And he actually, I've, I've, I've always been you know, really interested in him. Part of the reason, uh, you know, he's a Kentucky uh, commander, I'm sort of fighting on home turf, so to speak. Um, I lived at the bottom house when I first started working at Perryville for a few months. So any regiment that fought near there, I sort of have an affinity for uh, too. So, uh, you know, it was a fun, fun way to start my career down at the battlefield. Long answer to a short question. Oh, no, that's, that's, uh, that's very good. Uh, do we have any other uh... Any other questions? I have lots of questions, but I don't want to, you know, want to hog the hog the mic. But I, I was just we've all, I think we've always all been concerned about the you know the you know the more big picture campaign uh, with Kirby Smith. Uh, what, what's your opinion? I guess just because I don't want to go into the details of yeah. the whole campaign, but. But what I mean, you know, Kirby Smith was always an eccentric carrier, a character right. to, to be kind to him. But yes. uh, what, what's your what's your approach on that subject? Yeah, I I think Smith, in a sense, sort of blew it. So what happened was Bragg, you know, Bragg and Smith were both commanding armies in uh, um, sort of west of Nashville, Tennessee, um, by the summer of 1862, and they were sort of trying to protect Chattanooga. And they wanted to move on Buell's army, um, which had uh, gathered in Nashville. And so the plan was that Kirby Smith would move into the Cumberland Gap, would take the Cumberland Gap, uh, sort of push Union forces out of uh, eastern Kentucky as a way to protect the Confederates' right flank as they moved across Tennessee, um, heading westward. Um, Smith, however, after uh, taking the Gap, uh, he later claimed that uh, um, supplies or a lack of supplies forced him to march into Kentucky. So he sort of left Bragg hanging in uh, Middle Tennessee. Smith decided to advance his wife and move on a brilliant result. He sort of um, ignored the plan he'd come up with and uh, decided to head into Kentucky on his own. And so when Bragg saw this, I mean, Kirby Smith wrote a letter to his wife. It said, you know, like Cortez, I've burned my ships behind me. And I've headed into Kentucky for great glory. And, uh, you know, he was hoping to sort of single-handedly um, wrest control of the bluegrass state back into rebel hands. But, uh, you know, he goes jaunting off into Kentucky and leaving Bragg holding the, the bag in front of Buell at Nashville. So Bragg then realizes, if I don't go into Kentucky too, um, Smith's going to be destroyed. It's going to cause me problems. So he then sort of... Um, um, moved into Kentucky 
uh, west of uh, Kirby Smith, sort of coming in the state near Bowling Green, Kentucky, advancing up to Munfordville, where Buell's army finally chased him, fought a battle there. Buell peeled off to Louisville, Bragg peeled off to Central Kentucky, and sort of the stage was set for Perryville. So Smith and Bragg were sort of uh, leading separate commands. Jeff Davis never put uh, Bragg in command, overall command, which left a you know, sort of fractured command structure. So Smith sort of did what he wanted throughout the campaign, even though he was victorious at Richmond. He and uh, Bragg's army never really linked until the campaign was sort of, you know, over by that point. And so I think if Smith had been a little more attentive to uh, Bragg's needs, even though Bragg in, in his, his own way was, uh, you know, a mess and a, uh, a failure on his own part in many instances, I think that, you know, the campaign would have gone a lot better for the Confederates. But there are a lot of great books, you know, on like uh, Ken Knows, Perryville, This Hand Grand Havoc of Battle is a great one, too, that gives you an overview. And, um, you know, that's that's a good one where you get a good idea of the campaign, too. And the and uh, and what's your feeling on the Hafendorfer book? I think, you know, my feeling is reading about Perryville, no matter what you read, is a good thing. You know, I think Ken Knows book is, is, um, is a little newer and, uh, you know, um, I like Hafendorfer's book. It's a lot more, it, it has a lot, if you like really, if you, like, if you like a lot of details about reading your Civil War history, about where individual regiments were going, that's the book for you. If you want a little bit more of an overview, um, take, check out Ken No's book, which I really recommend to anybody um, all the time. And if you want sort of a very big, um, sort of 30,000 foot view of the whole campaign, look at James Lee McDonough's War in Kentucky from Shiloh to Perryville. That's you know, sort of a good overview of the whole campaign um, that McDonough did. Now, there's only one book on the aftermath of the battle that I'll recommend, which you know, was, <laughs> my, would, would be mine, but I guess I have to recommend that one. But, uh, well, and then, and then I, I actually, I, I wrote a command study of Manny's brigade at Perryville too. If you're, if you really want to get in the weeds about a specific brigade right. that endured the heaviest fighting, that's another one that I wrote um, as well. Well, so. I, well I, I could say for myself, I, I consider the subject of, your talk and your book, uh, a very interesting one. We, when we spoke the other day, uh, last week or a few days ago, uh, this is a subject I think that should interest us all. Uh, I got very interested in after we went to Vicksburg last year and I read Occupied Vicksburg. Uh, what happens after the armies start to move on uh, right. is very intriguing to me. Uh, you can always follow the army somewhere else, but what happens to the people who are left behind right. uh, is, is, uh, is very interesting to me, at least. And there yeah, um, seems to be a lot, uh, quite a few books coming out now, or at least some books, and yours is one of them. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a very interesting uh, subject, especially Perryville. Perryville. Perryville is very interesting to me. I, I think now that when we were there, we were, you know, we were walking, perhaps walking over the graves of people. Yeah. I don't get that feeling when I walk on other battlefields, although we, right. may, we may be doing that. But from your presentation here, I'm, I'm very impressed looking back that we were, that there may be so many people there uh, who are still in the ground uh, and makes Perryville a, a, perhaps unique. I, I don't know for sure. But Well, and, you know, I think one thing that does make Perryville unique too, it's today I would argue it's among the best preserved battlefields in the country because when you go there, you know, with the exception of maybe one set of power lines, you're, you're seeing exactly what soldiers um, who were there in October of 1862 would have seen. And that's one thing that makes that place really, really special. You know, there is a museum on site. Um, there is the Confederate Cemetery with the monument. There are a couple other monuments there and some interpretive signs. But other than that, you know, when you're looking at a hill or you're looking at a ravine, you know, it's not it's not covered over by monuments. You're seeing exactly what the, the uh, soldiers saw. And, you know, Ed Bars, who was just a huge fan of Perryville, was a wonderful supporter of it. You know, he wrote us a letter once and said, you know, walking at Perryville is walking in the footsteps of history. And I think, you know, it's, it's the best way to to describe that feeling when you go there. It's you know, a very moving place and a very uh, special place, you know, honored to have had the chance to work there, work there for about 10 years. So, yeah, um, yeah I, I agree with you 100 uh, percent. There's Pea Ridge and there's Pickett's Mill. Yeah. And, and I mean, Shiloh, of course, and Antietam are there. But there's of course, there's lots of monuments. Uh, right. Pickett's Mill, uh, P. Ridge and Perryville. They're, they're, I think those are three top best preserved places. Oh, yeah. 
But well, Please. if come come back, you know, I'd love to have a chance to show you guys around. Uh, you know, yeah, what's COVID gonna, so far? We're, we're going to walk get the you around. Real, we were there in 2009, and so maybe, you know, we have a few tours planned. Uh, uh, well, Mark, uh, you'll have to cancel yeah. those tours, and you'll just have to come <laughs> to Central Kentucky, you know? <laughs> well, we I think we, we're planned for next year and the year after, so I guess 23. Yeah, uh, I give think me a Kurt, call. I'll be happy to meet you all. Kurt Tomasco may be taking us to the Red River, which would be very interesting. Hey, that'd be good. Uh, but then after that, uh, we, we, you know, we're, I think we, we could be game for that for sure. It's just a great place to go. I love Kentucky. Uh, but if there are no more uh, questions, I will just make this announcement. Uh, next month, where am I? November 12th, we have John Scales, John R. Scales on General, General Nathan Bedford Forrest. So that's our upcoming uh meeting for next month uh and again i will solicit any other questions you all may have questions comments on uh stewart's well, presentation if i could just say thanks for your hospitality uh you know via zoom uh this has been fun and uh you know it's great to meet you guys and see you all and uh see bruce again too and if you guys could send me some uh sausage and peppers from that restaurant bruce i'd be i'd be thrilled so uh there's there's some places uh, that are Pretty good on that, you know. Some pretty good Italian restaurants. In that Chicago. was good. Maybe, maybe we could, maybe we could arrange that. It's uh, 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 the the, uh, the the talk was excellent. Uh, I thank Mark Kunis uh, for being our host. Mark, thank you, Mark. Uh, he uh, he was in there. He was his uh, face was in uh, in view for a moment, but he's uh, he's gone incognito here. But it was a delightful talk. Uh, you 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 are. Uh, an expert on, on the field, so to speak, uh, of, of Perryville and on the subject of the war in uh, Kentucky uh, uh, generally. It's, uh, it's a delight to have you, Stuart. I, 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 and, and, uh, and I'm honored to have uh, gotten to know you through uh, setting all this up and, uh, and getting you on screen here for us. It's, it's too bad we couldn't have you in person. It would have been far uh, superior for everyone else to be able to, you know, to, to talk to you in person. Uh, we look forward to the time when maybe that can, can happen over the next year or two. Uh, we'll, we'll be, we'll be, we'll, we'll keep doing this. We've got our 800th coming up. Uh, it would have been this Christmas, but it'll be a few months after that, our 800th meeting. And wow. so, uh, we'll be seeing you in the future. I, I, I certainly hope so. I hope so too. And you know, if you all ever have a speaker cancel and you need a Zoom, just let me know. If you have to talk about yeah, Mill Springs yeah. or anything else, so keep well, me in your, mind. Your, your new book sounds in, intriguing. The way you described it to me, uh, I quoted it verbatim. There, yeah, thanks. Uh, sounds pretty. Sounds pretty interesting. So, uh, as long as uh, there are no further questions, I will uh, consider the meeting uh, adjourned. Thank you. And, uh, Excellent spin- session. Thank you. Spin- thanks for having me. Yeah, it's good to see you all. I, I you know, again, I miss the in-person, uh, I miss the in-person uh, uh, meetings. Uh, th- that's what makes this, you know, makes it fun for all of us. I, I, we're all, I think we're all itching to get back together and meet with each, each other in person. Absolutely. Uh, break bread and, uh, you know, every, everything else. Uh, so uh, I'm going to call Brian later on the weekend. Uh, discuss a couple points. But uh, with that, uh, I'll say good evening and uh, stay safe, everyone. And uh, we'll see you in Danville one of these days, Stuart. Thank you so much. And and Brian, thanks to you too. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Bruce. Good seeing you guys. Take care. Thank you, you, Stuart. Take care, all of you. John, good evening. Scott, Dan, Brian, Bruce, Jerry, good talking to you. (laughs) Ha, ha, ha.